Amen. It is so good to see you uh, today. If you have your Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and grab it and turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27 through 31. Uh, and if you're using one of our Bibles located underneath, underneath the seat in front of you, you can turn to page 713. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, let me encourage you, take one of those Bibles home with you. They don't do any good sitting underneath the seat week after week. So take it home, write your name in it. If somebody tries to stop you, hit them in the head with it. It's your Bible. It's your gift. And we want you then to learn how to love people after you take it. So... Now, make no mistake about it. We believe that if we read God's word and apply God's word, he will change our lives. And we love celebrating life change here. There's not a person who is a follower of Jesus that is the same today as they were yesterday. God keeps changing us. God keeps transforming us. And my prayer today is that as we look at this passage in Isaiah, wherever you are at in your walk with Jesus, but especially for those who are broken or for those who are hurting, you will find the comforting presence of God in your life. So last week we began a series through the, uh, through the, uh, through the book of Isaiah and we're looking at some of the incredible promises found in Isaiah. Now, we're not talking about Isaiah Thomas. So if you're a LA Laker fan or you remember or Isaiah Thomas, he was a Pistons, right? Is that Detroit Pistons? I don't even remember. We're not talking about him anyway. Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament and God used Isaiah and spoke to the Israelites. Now, the Israelites were God's chosen people. The Israelites were the ones that God had called uh, to himself and selected. He promised uh, to protect them, to bless them and to guide them. The Israelites had experienced God's mighty protection and blessing all over their lives. Yet now in today's passage, they're a broken people. And maybe you've been there before where you've experienced some incredible great things happening in your life, but today you feel broken and you're hurt. Throughout the Israelite history, they had an incredible moments and it looked like when all hope was lost, God showed up in the nick of time and rescued them and delivered them. Uh, you may remember God rescued the Israelites uh, from their captivity, their slavery while they were in Egypt. And when it looked like that they reached the, uh, the end of the line as Pharaoh's armies chased after them and they hit the Red Sea, God parted the water and they were able to cross through it. That God provided food and water for the Israelites as they wandered in the desert for 40 years, that God gave the Israelites the Ark of the Covenant and that God's spirit was in the Ark of the Covenant. And wherever the Israelites went, the spirit of God went with them. God led the Israelites to victory after victory after victory. The walls of Jericho fell down simply because the Israelites marched around the walls and the walls tumbled down. Through God's power and might using the Israelites, one man could battle a hundred and win. And we, of course, we talked about a few weeks ago, David killed Goliath. The rest of the nations knew and they were convinced that the Israelites were God's chosen people and that God fought for them. Victory after victory after victory. But then... The Babylonian armies invaded Jerusalem, defeated the Israelites, and the Ark of the Covenant vanished from history. In captivity, the Babylonians forced the Israelites into slave labor. Uh, they, they forced them to do their farming for them, to raise their crops, to work as slaves in the fields of their lands. And every now and then the Babylonian army would go back into another Israelite city and bring more people back into slavery, into bondage and force them into slave labor. It's the first time in centuries that the Israelites weren't experiencing victory. It's the first time in a long time that the Israelites were a defeated people. For many of them, God's presence was gone. They lived under the rule of another government with another people who worshiped false gods and idols. Now think about their path. 
God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. God had blessed them with victory. He gave them the promised land. God had guided them. He lived among them. Then they were defeated by another nation and they were enslaved once again. They were turned to slavery once again. I think many followers of Jesus recognize that pattern in their lives. They're set free from sin by surrendering their lives to Jesus. They begin to experience victory after victory after victory in their life. And, and, and they experience the presence of God living in their hearts. And they know they have a great relationship with God. And then they fall back into the captivity that sin brings. They feel defeated once again. I don't know where you're at and I don't know where life has led you. I don't know why many of you are here today, but I do believe that some of you are experiencing brokenness and some of you feel defeated and some of you may even ask the question this week, why has God abandoned me? Why do I feel so alone? Why do I feel like everybody else has it all together in their relationship with God and I'm by myself? With that in mind, I want us to read what God said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Listen to what Isaiah said to a people who were discouraged, to a people who were broken, who, to a people who were afraid. He said, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah begins this passage asking that question in verse 27. Why do you say that God has forgotten about you? Why do you say that God does not care about you? And then he unpacks in the rest of the scripture, he, he reassures them just as he desires to reassure you and I today that God has not forgotten your troubles. God has not forgotten your troubles. The Israelites walked through 70 years of captivity. And during that season of hardship, they began to doubt that God really cared for them. They began to think that God had changed his mind about them, that God had deserted them, and that God had chosen maybe another nation to show his favor to. See, the Israelites forgot who God really was, and they began to think that God was more like a human being than the everlasting, all-powerful God. They began to think thoughts like, well, God stopped loving us. God's forgotten about us. God's changed his mind about us. God was too weak to stop the Babylonian army from taking us into captivity. He couldn't stop the Ark of the Covenant from being destroyed. And I think that like the Israelites, I think that sometimes people think God no longer cares for them when they walk through a difficulty or a hardship or they live underneath a terrible diagnosis or maybe a spouse abandons them or they experience job loss or the death of a loved one or financial loss or anything that causes them pain. And if right now you're living through a nightmare today, I want you to know God has not abandoned you. God has not forgotten you. He has not rejected you. You matter to God. You are important. He does love you. And even if you have made a mess out of your life, even if somebody else has made a mess out of your life, God still cares for you. God still loves you. Even if everyone that you know has turned their backs on you and walked away from you, God has not walked away from you. 
He sees the mess that you are in. He knows the troubles that you are facing. He does not ignore you. He does not forget you. God has not removed you from his list of priorities. And that's because God is not susceptible to human limitations. God is not susceptible to human limitations. God is not a human, but sometimes when we are hurting and sometimes when we feel overwhelmed and discouraged about life, sometimes when we feel that crushing weight of sin and brokenness that surrounds us, sometimes we begin to think that God is like us. We think that God is limited, that God is too busy to care for us, that God has better things to do than to bless you, to help you, or to rescue you. And maybe you've even gotten to the point where you believe that God has grown tired of listening to you pour your heart out to him, that you've become a bother to the living God, that God is annoyed by your actions. Let me tell you something, that is not the God that Isaiah teaches us about. Isaiah wrote on to remind the people that God is not like a human being. God is not limited by our weaknesses, by our, uh, by our imperfections, by our fragility. He writes in Isaiah 40, 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God did not forget about the hardships that the Israelites were experiencing. Their hurts and their pains mattered greatly to the living God. Isaiah said, haven't you heard? He's the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Of course he cares for you. God's power and his might go far beyond what we could ever possibly comprehend. There is nothing our God is unable to do. His power is limitless. His strength is matchless. His energy is infinite. Now you and I, we're humans. Our energy is not infinite. We get tired, we get cranky, we get irritable, we need to rest. And sometimes we even get irritated and annoyed by broken people around us. Sometimes we think, gosh, I wish they would just get their act together. I wish they would just stop all this moaning and groaning accept responsibility for their lives, pick up their brokenness and move on. But God never gets tired of helping us. And God never gets tired of helping you. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. Effortlessly, he created the entire galaxy with his words. Effortly, effortlessly, he created the most complex organism uh, ever studied underneath a microscope. He understands all things because he is the creator of all things. So you do not have a problem that is too complex, too deep for him to understand. God can untie any knot in your life. He can solve any puzzle. He can fix any problem. Nothing is too difficult for our God. But when we are overwhelmed in that brokenness, we sometimes forget that God is everlasting and that his wisdom is unsearchable. When we're overwhelmed and we're troubled in our brokenness, we begin to think that God is like us, that God is a human. And sometimes we think that because we get annoyed with people, maybe God's annoyed with us. Let me ask you a question. Is there somebody in your life that you avoid because they annoy you? They, they get underneath your skin. Is there somebody in your life that you find obnoxious? Uh, can you picture their face? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's an in-law. Maybe it's somebody in your life that simply grates against your heart and mind whenever you see them. Raise your hand if you have somebody in your life like that. Shout out their name in one, two, three. Look, if you feel broken and if you feel beyond hope, there's a problem. 
If you feel broken beyond hope, if you feel like there's no way God can take the pieces of your broken lives and put them back together, if you feel like God is not able to redeem what's been broken in your life and turn it into something good, you are preventing God from working in your life. You have stopped seeing God as the everlasting to everlasting. You've stopped seeing God as the all-powerful, infinite, matchless, priceless King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you've reduced God to an awkward friend that you stick down in your pocket and you pull him out from time to time to talk to. You have forgotten about his greatness. When we walk through difficulties and hardships, we have got to remind ourselves of the greatness of our God because his greatness brings comfort and hope to us. I love how the apostle Paul wrote about the greatness and the majesty and the splendor of Jesus in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He writes this about Jesus. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. That is such an incredible illustration of the supremeness of Jesus Christ. When you are feeling overwhelmed, we can't, you cannot turn to a mascot that we rally around. When we feel overwhelmed, we don't turn to a cheerleader that we have on our po- in our pocket that, tur- that, that, uh, that uh, encourages us. We turn to the God, we turn to Jesus who is everlasting to everlasting. Jesus is not a buddy in our pocket, he is Lord. He is great, he is majestic and powerful. There is nothing that he cannot help you with. There is nothing he cannot deliver you from. There is no part of the brokenness of your life that he cannot take and put it back together. He sustains everything. He holds the galaxies together in his hands and he is capable of rescuing the broken and the hurting and restoring their lives. See, understanding the greatness of God helps us to turn to him, to trust him, to rescue us. So the question is, how is he going to rescue and deliver you? How is he going to do that? Well, I love, I love what he does. God uses his infinite power to serve, not take. So here's all this power that the Supreme King of Kings and Lord of Lords has, and he doesn't use it in a corrupt way. He doesn't use it to take from us. Instead, God gives his strength to us. God gives his strength to the broken. God gives his strength to the hurting. Look at verse 29. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. That is a jaw-dropping, mind-shattering truth. God is not selfish. God is not hoarding his power. God serves people by giving his everlasting, infinite power to the broken, to the weak, to the hurting, the tired, the weary. God doesn't sit around and laugh at your brokenness. God does not shame the weak or shame the powerless. Instead, God gives them power and strength. That's why you can walk through difficulties. You can walk through brokenness. You can walk through hardships expecting to win because you have a God who will strengthen you. You have a God who is for you. And even when circumstances don't turn out the way that you hoped that they would, God will strengthen you. God will encourage your spirit. 
you are able to overcome the brokenness and the shame that you may have in your life, even right now, because God's strength, his infinite strength is available to you right now. You know, when I grew up in Tennessee, where I grew up in Tennessee, local people would do something that was really horrible with pets that they no longer wanted. There was a dumpster at the end of our road and out in the country. And when everybody, whenever anybody got tired of their pet or got annoyed by their pet or their pet developed some type of goiter or cancer, they would drive their dog out to these dumpsters and leave them there to pick through the trash that other people had discarded and abandon them. Somebody needs to hear this. You've not been abandoned. You have not been abandoned by God. God loves you and he is ready right now to give you his unlimited strength and power to work through whatever hardships you are facing. And finally, all who hope in God will find new strength. All who hope in God will find new strength. Circle the word all. All who hope in God will find new strength. Verse 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How does God renew our strength? How, how, how can you experience his strength and his power right now? Well, first, you've got to come to a point where you've surrendered your life to Jesus. That's where you begin. There's no other way for you to receive renewal of strength but through Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one, no one, no one, no one can come to the Father except through me. Is your spouse a believer in Jesus and you're hoping that some way you're gonna get to heaven because your spouse is a believer? Jesus says you don't get to heaven through your spouse. Are your parents born again followers of Jesus? Did they raise you in the church? You don't get to heaven on somebody else's faith. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one. So your first step to experience the strength and the power of God at work in your life is to surrender your life to Jesus and place your faith in him. That means you give up control of your life. You, 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 you look at God and say, God, you can manage my life a whole lot better than I can. And not only will God begin to manage your life, he's also gonna begin to pick up the brokenness of your life. You invite him into your life by receiving Jesus as your savior. Romans 10, 9, Paul said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can do that right now. You can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord right now. You can believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead right now. And I invite you to do that right now. In fact, across this room, I wanna invite you to close your eyes, bow your heads for just a moment. And I want you to think about Romans 10, 9, and I want you to think about whether or not you have surrendered your life into the hands of Jesus. I want you to think about whether or not you've received Christ as your savior and you've trusted him. And if the answer is no, but you want to, then I wanna help you find the right words to say to God. Because if you want to, there's already faith that's growing in your heart. God is giving you the faith to believe him. You have a desire to surrender your life to Jesus. Let me help you formulate that faith into words. Say something like this. God, I've messed up. Sin has crushed me. I've been choosing to live a life on my own way my own terms, but today 
I surrender control to you. I know you can manage my life a whole lot better. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty on the cross for my sins. I believe I can be forgiven and receive the power and the strength that comes through the resurrecting power of Jesus. And Jesus, I receive you as my savior. Amen.